The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Schroeder Investment Management Australia Limited, ABN 22000443274, AFSL 226473, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Ready to establish a consistent approach to investing that brings rigour to your team and clarity to your clients? Welcome to the Ensemble Investment Philosophies in Action series. I'm Peter diamond and I'm here to bring you practical insights straight from Australia's top financial advisors. In this series, we cut through the noise and focus on the essential steps to building and then executing a powerful investment philosophy. Hear firsthand from our guests as they share real-world challenges and triumphs, giving you clear, actionable strategies to implement in your own practice. Tune in to the Investment Philosophies in Action series and elevate your financial advising with a philosophy that truly resonates with your clients. For six decades, Schroeder's Australia's investment expertise and agility has helped deliver consistent long-term returns for their local clients. With one of Australia's most experienced on-the-ground research teams, backed by over 220 years of compounded knowledge of global financial markets, Schroeder's clients continue to benefit from their proven investment approach, deep wisdom, and focus on investing beyond tomorrow. Schroeder's Australia manages assets for institutional and wholesale clients across Australian equities, fixed income, multi-asset, and global private market strategies, including private equity. Hello and welcome to this very special Ensemble podcast mini-series where we're diving into the practical application of an investment philosophy through the real-life experience of advice practitioners and investment gurus from within the Ensemble network. I'm Peter Diamantitis and the guest joining me here today has degrees in law, business and accounting. I'm amazed he survived all of that. Is the founder and managing director of Family Wealth Advisory and like myself is based here in Sydney. Welcome, Michael Bover. And thank you so much for agreeing to share your investment philosophy journey with us. My pleasure, Peter. Absolute pleasure to be here. <laughs> oh, I'm excited to get into the nitty gritty. So, this is episode two of the Investment Philosophy series, and our focus for this episode is really capturing the steps, you know, to implementing an investment philosophy. So, let's, before we dive in, I just want to get a bit of context first, actually. So, in terms of, well, clearly, you know, woefully overqualified in the background. But when you first uh, started in financial advice, what area did you specialize in initially? So, obviously, coming from a background in law and accounting, uh, we're very strategy-based and uh, I I definitely love the strategy components. So, we tended to focus more around family business owners. Right. Uh, Tends to be a lot of complexity around strategy, helping them with asset protection, tax planning, but really at the heart and soul for us is the controlling the cash flow. Right. Uh, It gets a little more complex with family businesses because cash flow sits generally within structures and then how do you most tax efficiently get it out? So, they tended to be our starting position in terms of uh, our core families that we started looking after and then we sort of built um, built our practice out from, from there. there. So, in terms of your sort of personal take, you know, you as human being as well as advisor, um, yep. then, you know, would you call yourself a passionate investor outside advice? You know, do you have 40 screens at home and, and you're watching all the different markets? Or like, where would you place yourself, you know, as an individual in terms of investing? Yeah, absolutely. So, I've landed in an area that I'm very passionate about and love. So, in the investing world, absolutely love. Um, from a from an interest point of view, love macroeconomics and okay. from uh, how the investments all work. But but really, at the heart and soul of, of investments is it's it's almost like a personal development discovery. It's your <laughs> relationship with money because you know, and we'll get into this when we talk about investment philosophies. But um, it's it's about having the investment and having that investment work for you over time without breaking strategy. Mm. And if you don't really know your relationship with money and and your ability to tolerate volatility, um, you won't get those long-term compound returns. And so, we've yeah. tried to build a practice where we try to get to know our clients really, really well and then match them up with uh, a portfolio that's sort of consistent with their tolerance for volatility. 
Absolutely. Because, I mean, it's no different to sort of, you know, eating well and understanding your triggers. You yeah. know, like I think <laughs> investing is the same, right? Like, what are, what for you, what are the triggers? You know, what are the things that are going to make you do something that really you'll regret later? Because that wasn't smart. That wasn't what I should have done. But you're reacting to a situation, you know? Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. The, the, the volatility we place in, the, we see in the investment market sort of plays out all, all through life. So, yeah. Um, you know, and, and, and food and, and the way that we react to lots of things are, are very similar. So, like, Sometimes you, you want to just have some chocolate or some sugar, and you get a sugar hit, and you feel really good, Woo-hoo, and then you spike yeah. up, and then you sort of crash down, and then you go, like, "Oh my god, I've got to get another sugar exactly. hit." Um, whereas if you if you tend to have the discipline of maybe eating foods that you know will give you good long term energy, mm-hmm. you'll avoid those sort of spikes and crashes, and and tend to have a slightly better day. Absolutely, I feel like we've just gifted everybody with another analogy for how they're describing markets. <laughs> to be honest, that has never occurred to me before. I love it. I love it. Discovery process for me. Me too. Well, my team's bet me that I somehow I need to draw a dishwasher analogy into investment portfolio construction into this talk. Right. So we'll see how we go. Game on. Fantastic. <laughs> All right. <laughs> so, for complete list then, just so we can anchor everybody for, you know, your practice and how you've approached things, what did you land on in terms of an investment philosophy? What was the sort of core thing that you decided this is for us? Yeah. So, uh, my sort of fundamental starting position is that the markets are mostly relatively efficient. So, we really want to be able to price our clients in from a beta point of view. So, we tend to to be quite heavy on the index as a starting position. Mm -hmm. As I mentioned, we did start with family business clients. So, in in my experience, most family business clients were typically family business, call it private equity play, Mm -hmm. commercial property, which supported their private business and lots of cash. Uh, But with with our strategies over time, the investment portfolios tended to build up. So, we kept it fairly plain vanilla. We kept it fairly index-driven, Vanguard-driven, multi-manager from an asset allocation point of view. And that sort of aligned with my core beliefs in terms of mostly the markets are, are efficient. But as we touched on in terms of psychology... Uh, markets can tend to get a bit skewed, a bit overvalued, a bit undervalued, particularly when fear and greed tend to, to kick in. Yeah. Um, so, what we wanted to do was be able to blend in around that sort of core belief that the markets are mostly efficient, but have a tendency to sort of misbehave at times, yeah. to have some sort of active overlay. So, I guess our core philosophy is price in beat up but have some levers where we can control when the markets get a little bit skewed. So, we have a sort of a core satellite as our fundamental philosophy. Okay. And how long has it been since you sort of did this work, you know, when you sort of, you know, revisited it and and did it in a structured way for your investment philosophy? So, so we, so when I first set the practice up uh, a little bit over 14 years ago, um, really because we were leaning pretty heavily on Vanguard and their multi-manager, we were Mm -hmm. sort of relying on Vanguard's, um, you know, market-based assumptions for the strategic asset allocation. And that was pretty good for us for the first or maybe eight years. But yep. as I mentioned, because we, well, we were very good at training our family business clients in terms of how to control that cash flow. And before we knew it, all this cash flow was driving in <laughs> and the portfolio was just kind of build, um, portfolio assets were building around us. So, we went right. from 30 mil to 80 mil to 150 mil. We're now sort of north of 250. And so, as that got bigger and bigger, we needed a more sophisticated solution there. And that's when we started to, to look down this more um, managed account solution. Okay. And it was in 2000. 2019 that we launched our official family wealth portfolios, which we do in conjunction with Mercer, who sit yep. as our investment manager, and yep. Brad Matthews as an asset consultant as well. So, both of them sit on our investment committee, but we did spend quite a lot of time before we launched the portfolios in terms of mapping out our investment philosophy, the construction of the portfolio, what it would look like, um, and then sort of launch it and, and off we went. So, I'd say... The first, uh, what's that, nine years, we were leaning probably heavily on um, uh, AMP Capital and Vanguard and blending up their SAA. And yep. then from 2019 onwards, really leaning heavily in terms of Mercer's um, capital market assumptions and Brad Matthews in terms of our SAA um, solution. Perfect. Okay. So, so it's had some time. You know, you've had some time to sort of let it in bed, despite the fact that, you, you know, it's just before COVID. So, I'm sure that we'll get into some nuances around that if you've launched something just a year before everybody goes, you know, oh, virtual. You know, we, we were very lucky there from a timing perspective because we didn't preempt COVID. But being in a position with managed portfolios, uh, and, and obviously we'll go into some of the benefits of those, but one is the ability to move quickly and move yeah. everyone quickly. And COVID, the market was bouncing around 5% on a daily basis. 
was it was very very volatile. So we were in a sort of a uniquely beautiful position where if the investment committee decided to make a move on a change, we could do it overnight. We could just yeah. execute it across the entire portfolio. So um, that that played out very well for us, despite it being very very volatile times. Yeah, perfect, perfect. So let's. Um I think it's great to start like with the advice team. So you've you've got the concept, you you sort of you you know what you want to do. Um, how many advisors are in the practice? So there's three advisors in the Sydney practice. We've yeah. got one advisor who operates down in Sylvania Waters. Okay, and then the the rest of the team around them. What's the sort of total practice size? Yep. So we've got one GM. We've got a practice manager who also operates as my EA and CSO. Um, I've got we've got two associates in the practice. Uh, we've got an, another CSO. Uh, we've got two para planners and one administration. And we've just recently brought on a um, chief technology officer, a CTO. Okay, so quite a crew there. So, I'm <laughs> curious, let's let's narrow in initially on the advice team. So, was there a job to sort of bring everybody on board with this? I mean, uh, you know, I've, we've all been in and out of a, lot, a number of practices and, and invariably, if you sit in a room with a group of advisors, there's always, you know, a different take on investing or markets or, or what their preferences are. How did you manage that process and how involved, you know, were they in the sort of selection or, or you know, the 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 vision of what the investment philosophy would be. Yeah, look, that, that's a really good question. Luckily or unluckily, depending on how you view it, when we constructed the investment philosophy, it was just me uh, okay. when, the, when the practice was first born. In 2019, when we really rejigged it and dived very deep in terms of not only documenting the investment philosophy, but really sort of building it out in a, in a well-constructed portfolio. Once again, I was still the only um, advisor. I had and my advisor down in Sylvania, but really, I was still kind of sitting at the heart and core of it. Okay. So, it was more all myself and my beliefs working with our investment managers and building it out. Uh, so, when the new ad- well, we've only just probably over the last two to three years started to scale up a bit and bring on the other advisors. So, that's been more about a journey about passing on the investment philosophy and this is right. why we do what we do. But that's part of the culture of why people come and work for us as well. So, if someone was a very act- active, um, they saw themselves as an advisor and adding value by being a very active manager and picking this stock and th- th- this wouldn't be a good home for them because it's yeah. not consistent with our investment philosophy. It wouldn't be consistent with our culture and how we work with our families. We, we want to work with our families, control their cash flow, get it working for them, get that compound interest, you know, the, the eighth wonder yeah. of the world working for them. <laughs> Be clever around the edges about the portfolio. Um, uh, so, we're not dismissing the portfolio, but we're not there to try and time the top and bottom of the market. We're not trying to say that BHP is better than Rio and we're not trying to add alpha that way. We're very focused on the strategic side. So, that conversation with the advisors was probably just part of the onboarding process. Yeah, okay. Um, and it's a bit of a filtering process as well because um, we, we'll attract the advisors that are attracted to that sort of philosophy. And that's powerful, isn't it? Because really, it's one of the values of the practice for any practice. Oh, ab- absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. You know, As I said, it really goes to the core. Like at, at the core of our practice is really understanding our clients' relationship with money and helping them with that journey through life. Um, we'll help them control with really clever strategies. We've got a great investment committee. Um, one of the really good things and one of the reasons I decided to move down that professional um, outsourcing the investment mandate to professionals is – what they bring to the table in terms of their skill set is so different into, to what a strategic advisor brings to the table. Right. So, whilst I could run investment portfolios initially, when we started to need to get a little bit more sophisticated, they just bring a totally different skill set. You know, in terms of what Mercer brings in terms of their capital market stimu- um, uh, simulator assumptions in terms of portfolio constructions, um, correlation, like it's all very well and good to pick a fund. But if that fund is very correlated with another fund in there, then we're not really addressing the volatility component. And, and we're talking about clients' relationship with money and dealing with volatility. So, there's there, there's a whole sophistication that goes to portfolio construction that really is a skill within itself. Um, and then even the fund selection. I mean, they've got 1,500 analysts constantly interviewing each and every fund. We just don't have the resources. Yeah. Um, and, and nor is it sort of my lane. It's not, it's not really where my passion is to want to go and interview investment teams and 
are you delivering on what you're saying your mandate is? So, they've really brought a lot of heavy um, lifting to the table and as has Brad Matthews in terms of that. So, I'm really glad we've outsourced that to professionals and then their mandate is to say, well, what's the family wealth philosophy, like long-term intergenerational wealth? We don't mm-hmm. mind short-term volatility. We know that's the price of getting getting returns, but we don't want it to damage our long-term returns. We still want to protect our long-term capital. So, they work within that philosophy and then build that build that models out for us. And it's an interesting because, I mean, you almost answered the question before I asked it, but it's um – you know, as you were forming this, even though, I mean, we're talking about implementing here, but as you were sort of forming this for yourself and revisiting it um, back in 2019, then it's a bit difficult to have conversations with yourself. Like, <laughs> right? I mean, maybe, well, you know, when, when things get a bit busy and stressful, maybe we talk to ourselves, but generally that's a difficult thing to do, isn't it? And so it, it, then naturally fits that that was part of what you reached out for was yeah. was that you know external people that could sort of um, be part of that debate part of that conversation it was a, it was a really good exercise to go through because it really makes you focus on do you really believe in what you think is your philosophy? And then when this sophistication gets built around it, it really does make you say, yes, I, I do believe in this or look, there's a nuance here. Um, we need to build that in because I wasn't aware of that. So, it was, a, it was a wonderful exercise to go through. Initially, when I was building it out and starting to put a managed portfolio together, I was looking at a solution maybe through State Street or BlackRock because they were more index type driven. Yep. And I just felt it didn't quite um, deal with those parts of the the portfolio that we wanted to be able to pull levers on where we needed an active overlay. Right. And and so, that's why we landed with Brad and, and Mercer because it, it gave us the ability to have a call, deliver on the call, but pull levers. Like, as, as a perfect example, when, when bond, the, the bond market rallied and rates sort of almost fell down to zero, that's wonderful. But really, the risk there was, what, were, were rates going to go deeply negative or was there a chance that they could reverse and go up? Mm. Because we had the ability to pull levers, we could put, we could put into the portfolio active managers like Ardea or the Franklin um, and, and control duration risk. So, right. in 2022, which was a brutal year for all investors, <laughs> we weren't av- able to avoid all the pain, but we could take some of that pain out as the bond market just sort of fell 8 to 10%. So, yeah. it's, it's the ability to sort of pull those levers. Um, yeah. But th- that's that focusing in terms of your core philosophy. And it's really critical to land on that because the absolute worst thing you can do when the markets get super volatile is to change your investment philosophy because you said, oh, I believe in this. Oh, it's not working well for me. I'm going to change philosophy and that's where you can yeah. really damage yourself. So, you really, if you're going down this path, you really want to get to the core of who you are, what you believe in, what is that philosophy and try not to chop and change it um, because you'll only really hurt yourself and damage yourself. Absolutely. And, and it's the, you know, it's the worst case of fair weather friend, you know, when, when you're jumping around like that, you've got to have at its core some beliefs. You know, it's probably values is a difficult way to describe it. It's just beliefs, things that you feel are true. Yeah. You know, or real. Um, and that's got to anchor you, doesn't it? So that then, cause there's just going to be, I mean, the last few years have demonstrated this. Um, who thought that we'd have to cope with a market that was dealing with nobody traveling anywhere in the whole world? Yeah. You know, like yeah. nobody had that in their slides, you know, a few years ago it was risks that we had to, you know, cope with. So clearly um, things are going to be unpredictable or just unfathomable. So, you know, what are the, what's the anchor that you create for yourself that helps you navigate that? Absolutely. That is so critical. And that's what we teach our clients is, look, you're going to experience some volatility, but you have to um, stay the course in terms of your strategy. If you've come in as an aggressive investor, the last thing you want to do is become ultra conservative when the markets get super volatile. If you've come in as a conservative investor and all of a sudden you go to a barbecue and people are getting 40% returns, you've got to stick to your strategy. So, that that really is the core for them. It's also the core for us as advisors. Um, So, that was a really, really great exercise to go through because it really just sort of cemented in my mind um, uh, a portfolio that not only can deal with our retail clients, high-end retail clients, but also deal with our sort of more um, high-level wholesale clients. Uh, and and we, we also play a little bit o- almost up in that virtual family office type 
So we needed a solution that could play across the whole. Oh, gamut. all of that. Yeah. Okay. And so then you've you know you've enunciated really well what what it is. I'm curious then about some mechanics. So so you know for the actual advice process in terms of the analysis, let's just dive into that. We're sort of mm. focusing on the advisors for the moment. Um, then you know the process of analysing and analyzing or preparing the advice. Did you have to get any extra tools or resources because of the choice you'd made? Like, was there any change to the actual? process itself for the advice process that you, as a result of this decision? Yeah. So, we um, – when, when I uh, – so, obviously, locked down the investment philosophy, brought the team together, and then we started to map out what the portfolio looked like. One of the great advantages of going with your own portfolio – well, for, for us, one mm-hmm. of the advantages of going with a family wealth portfolio rather than off the shelf is – we had existing core portfolios, which, as we talked about, were quite heavily indexed, about 75% mm. index. Okay. We were probably going to move it to about 50% index, but we had a good starting position. And this comes really back to that tax position and, and moving clients into the new world. And so, once we'd formulated our team and they've started to map out what your future portfolio is going to look like in the SMA, we then had sort of three, six, nine months while it was getting built out when we were doing reviews with clients that we would slowly sort of adjust their portfolios to what the new world would look like. Okay. So, when the portfolio launched, it was more a conversation around, are you happy to give up discretion? Because at the moment, you have full discretion. I will not make one change on your portfolio unless Without we sit you. down, have yeah. a chat, give you a statement of advice or record of advice and say, are you happy? Yes, sign action. If you're happy to give that discretion up to my investment committee and, and Mercer being the investment manager, and if our investment committee meets monthly and decides to make a change, it will go straight through. We'll report it to you. We'll, we'll report to you quarterly. If you're happy to make that change, you move into the new world. So, it was... It really removed a lot of the um, buy sell cost, tax cost, because it was a smooth transition from an existing portfolio in specie straight into the new world. Okay. That really made the implementation from our point of view so much easier. It became right. more about a conversation about discretion than. Okay. Now, th- there are obviously certain clients where the tax pain of moving into the new world straight away just didn't make sense. And yeah. so for them, it's sort of a slightly longer term journey that as cash builds up, we sort of build out the new world. Um, yeah. Uh, so yes. So for us, uh, th- that. That ability to work with the committee around our existing portfolio and build out one in terms of where we wanted the portfolio to go to without sort of wiping out the existing portfolio um, was kind of a critical part of the implementation for us. So, it sounds like then what you didn't need to do was um – I'm being really basic here and it probably doesn't apply to your practice, but, you know, change platforms as an example. So, well, there wasn't any of that that was required. That's right. There was a yeah. potential for that to happen. So, okay. step one, lock down investment philosophy. Step two, um, well, step one, choose your investment committee while um, building down, your, locking down your investment philosophy. Then where are you going to run those portfolios? So, mm. we then went to market and shopped it around all the platforms and said, who can come back and give us the most, the best solution? Now, we already had a good existing relationship with our platform and okay. luckily, they really came to the party and we were one of the first to launch in terms of our own portfolios on there and they've been a great partner for us on there as well. So, but what that did is not only did they come back and give us the best pricing for our clients, but they also avoided us having to to move all of our clients' (laughs) money from that platform to another platform, which would have been an enormous exercise. Yeah. It would have incurred, obviously, in-specie transfer costs, maybe a few buy-sell costs. So, yeah. um, luckily, the whole mapping out of this, which it, it, we did spend about 18 months really kind of um, before we did anything, building or, and, and thinking about how we wanted to construct this, uh, it worked out really neatly in the end. Um, we're luckily, our platform partner came to the party. Um, our investment committee worked with our existing portfolio and sort of built it out without sort of fully reconstructing it, which, which probably wasn't too hard to do because, as I said, 75% index down to 50% index, really, it's a 25% active build sure, out. So. Sure. Mm-hmm. So, and, and I'm interested, like that's quite a – I think that's an important insight is is how long you let this take. You know, so you're saying you had this build out process. Um, I'm betting that there will be people listening that sort of feel like there's a rush on with these things. Like it's, oh, once you've decided to do it, right, quick, we've got to do it within the next month or two. Um, so I'm curious about any other facets of that sort of planning stage um, that you incorporated. I mean, we'll get to change management internally and things like mm. that, but was there any other, I mean, let, you know, license, um, compliance, that sort of element? What, yes. what, what did you need to do there? Yeah, that, that's, that was an important point. 
point, which I, I've totally sort of skipped over. So thank you, Peter, <laughs> for bringing that one up. Uh, I used to be part of Charter. And yep. uh, so when I first set up, Charter were really good. They were part of AXA and they cash flow you into your own business. So I started with, with no clients and, and I thought, okay, but they give you the cash to get through 12 months and hopefully right. you've signed enough clients and you can refinance through a bank. So luckily did that. So they were a good partner. But over time, we just found it was, it was probably not that there was anything wrong with it, but it was probably time to set up our own license. Right. And, and the thing that really pushed us over the edge to do that was to give us the flexibility and freedom to run our own, um, uh, managed accounts. And okay. so really we, we did that transition out. So th- there was quite a bit of change over that period of time because we were going from charter to our own AFSL. There's quite a lot of work involved in setting up your governance and infrastructure in terms of compliance around your own AFSL. And we've had, we've got some great, um, support team. We're part of the principals community. Um, and that works really, really well in terms of compliance support. Um, but that then gave us the freedom to then work with our investment committee to build out our family wealth portfolios. So, yeah, that, that, that was sort of an important step for us. Um, now, certain advisors might be able to work within their existing licensee and have within their APL certain uh, managed accounts that they can run. Um, but for us, setting up our own AFSL, setting up our own managed portfolios was the way to go. Yeah, okay. And it is an important... <laughs> Part of the process is, you know, okay, what's the current framework I operate within and is that going to work for what I'm looking to do? And look, over time, I think that's certainly more the case. You know, you're talking sort of four years back or even longer. I mean, now I think a lot of dealer groups are are realizing that this is more what advisors need. You know, they need to be able to determine their own future on this stuff. So I think it has changed a bit, but it is an important consideration, isn't it? Is, is, is the current place that I'm sitting in going to, going to let me do what I really feel I need to, not just want to. Yeah. And look, there's some great managed, um, managed account solutions out there, um, run by some very big institutions. So, um, you know, I'm sure that there's solutions there. I guess step one is, a, is a managed account the right solution for you and your practice? If it is, do you want to do your own or do you want a white label or potentially just use an off-the-shelf one where you, at least I can sit down with my investment committee and we can have chats and have discussions around the direction of where we're going. Now, obviously, yeah. they bring to the table a certain skill set and so I wouldn't come outside my lane in terms of calling out their skill set, but also I'm managing clients and volatility. So, you know, at the heart of what we're trying to do is get risk-adjusted returns. We we want to get market-based returns but with lower volatility or slightly above um, market-based returns with similar volatility. So, that's kind of our, our key mandate. And I, I don't know, just working with our own framework, I think that works really well for us. And it, it is interesting because – and it's something that, you, you know, as an advisor, you can notice the difference between us and, say, teams within a, a large fund man- management business, say, is, is there – they're just that bit further distant from the end client, you know, from the end person's money. And so I think having a connector from the people debating in a room to the actual person that's going to have to discuss this with a client, that's really important, yeah. you know, because ultimately you've got to be able to connect those things. That's got to feel real. And even if there's a very valid reason for that decision, you've got to be able to then share that yep. with the people whose money you're doing that to, yeah. you know. I, I love being the guardian for our clients in yeah. terms of this is their money, this is their family wealth. We're the guardian in terms of making sure they're getting the right asset allocation. So, that's that's really important. But also, ultimately, the investment manager. So, mm. if for whatever reason, Mercer wasn't working out for us or Brad wasn't working out with it, I can't see a world where that's not the case. But imagine that we thought that, that something had changed. As the guardian, we can shift that. So, we can yeah. swap out the investment manager and bring in a different investment manager and, and off we go. And we can still maintain that guardian relationship and do what our, our role there is just to protect the client and bring in best of breed to make sure, you know, that their portfolio just runs really, really, really well. So, they can focus on doing, you know, what they love doing. Yeah, absolutely. So, let's go a little broader than just the advisors then. Um, you know, you've got, you know, a team around them. I'm actually interested in how involved they were in any of the initial research, that project you talked about, like what stage did you involve them in? How are we going to roll this out and, and their insights or their take on how that could go and what they needed to do? 
Yeah, so I think the team's involvement really, uh, really ramped up once we got to the implementation part yeah. because uh, I don't want to understate how much work is involved <laughs> moving from one world to another. Okay, so uh, but for us, it was worth it. Like it was just, it yeah. was in the client's best interest to do it. That they're better off. Um, our practice runs more efficiently, but ultimately, I think the client gets a better result. So for us, it wasn't a choice. Yeah. But but it is a big change. So because it, it you it is a statement of advice for every single client that moves from where they are to giving up discretion into a world where now the discretion mm. is run by an external manager. So that has an enormous impact in terms of the whole advice production. So now. We probably could have timed this a bit better. So, we moved licenses. So, that's a new statement of advice. And then 12 months later, we, everyone, majority of people moved into these management. So, that's another whole statement of advice. So, my para planning team, associate team, they were just under the hammer. They were getting smashed for about two oh, years, wow. which is so many statements of advice. Um, so, that was an enormous amount where their involvement was, they were very, very involved. Um, but luckily, got a, got a great team and we sort of got through that period. Um, but yes, a lot of work. They were very, very involved in that. Probably a little less so in terms of the investment philosophy and arriving at the investment manager choice. Right. I, I really sort of did take the lead on that and sort of drove most of that. But but absolutely in terms of Im- implementation, absolutely critical. And I think it's such an interesting change management piece because the um, the advisors, if advisors have resistance, generally it's on a belief or a value or even how they believe their value should be represented. You know, sometimes when these changes are made, it's like, well, hold on, you're almost taking the way, away yep. the thing that I see as my key core. So, you know, I get that. But interestingly, the difference with, you know, the rest of the team is often it's in the granularity. The minute you sort of say, hey, yay, we're doing this thing. They're like, oh, crap. <laughs> Because all they see is all the to-dos, yep. like all of the little little itty-bitty bits. So, I'm interested in the fact that you'd already done um, a major sort of mm. rollout because I'm betting for all that's horrible for them, I bet there was some things they picked up on how to do that better. You know, the first time, if we're going to do bulk, how can we do this better? How can we make this more streamlined? Was there any insights that transferred one from one to the other? Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, I brought a GM on in 2020. So, I think the machine was starting to crunch and smoke and uh, it was just, you know, there was so much coming through it. And what the GM has done brilliantly, what Bell's done brilliantly is process map out everything and then try to just, we just constantly quarterly catch up to try and just make it run a little bit more efficiently. So, and then as an owner, as a principal, I try to make all of my employees' life a little bit easier. So, I'm always just trying to say, what's the latest technology we can use that will just make their life a little bit easier? So, they're running X-Plan, but we'll give them an OPEX overlay in terms of X-Plan so that there's a functionality that works there. So, anything that we can do that just makes it a little bit more efficient, a little bit more easy to take the stress out, but definitely yeah. getting it all process mapped out. Everyone knew exactly what they wanted to do, um, took a little bit of stress out. So, I guess it kind of really focused it in just terms of making sure we ran a slightly more efficient practice. <laughs> Yeah, and I guess um because there are sort of two broad approaches to this sort of thing, you can sort of just start and and you sort of map things out as you go, and it can depend on the size of your team, like you say, but but or or you can go, all right, let's just take a, a moment, get everybody in a room, and map this out so that then we can at least pick those things that make things harder or things that make them easier, um, because until you do these, you know, it's. It's so hard to think in advance what can go wrong. But honestly, you know, in terms of ideas and efficiency, the support team are where it's at. That's where yeah. they, they they think of these things. They'll see it. They'll ask the right question. Or even if, you know, in terms of the implementation, often they'll have a relationship with somebody they can talk to and go, oh, you know, we could do this on that yeah. platform or, you know, that sort of stuff. Yeah. Um, you know, that granularity is really important. Yeah, and, and and really getting the team right and getting them all working together is just such an absolute critical part. It's, you know, it's hard for a small – so, I was a small practice. It was me and about five or six key staff until mm-hmm. I decided to bring on some extra advisors. And so, there's this real pain point between – And I tried to hire people and they would burn out and leave or it just didn't work out. And I I just said, oh, they weren't the right person. But in reality, if I was being truthful and and reflecting, I hadn't built the processes to give them the opportunity to thrive. That's truth be told, right? Until we'd sort of really process mapped out everything and we've got cases and threads and X plans just running, super efficient. When people come in now, they know exactly what's expected of them. What, what's, they just follow the bouncing ball through the system and it's given people an opportunity to really thrive. But yeah. for a small practice to be able to bring on a GM and process mapper, that's quite difficult to do. Normally you would bring a GM on once you're sort of 15, 20 people. Mm. So it's kind of chicken and egg. For me, it was mm. like I knew where I wanted to go. 
I, I kind of made that leap, brought them on, and and now we can sort of build in a sort of uh, le- less stressful environment and, and get the right people uh, on the bus um, heading off. So, but I but I don't dismiss how hard that decision is for smaller practices because it's a big investment. It's straight out of your pocket. Um, and if you're not looking to grow, maybe it's not worth doing. But for us, you know, we, we want to grow. We want to go from, say, three advisors to potentially five and just sort of see where we go. Wherever the scale yeah. gives us efficiency is kind of where we'll head. And look, it is, it's an interesting thing because you're right, historically, the the view has always been to get that, they used to, was it corporatized? It used to be an expression they used for when you did that to your practice, you know, and it became something more structured and, and you know, a GM or something like that was how to do it. Interestingly, I think, you know, now potentially a smaller practice might have the opportunity to just get a consultant in for a bit, mm. you know, get somebody in who can just spend time asking questions, you know, boxes and arrows, really lay it out because you're right, it can transform how you do things. Um, and if you don't have the structure, how do you know where the bottleneck is? Yeah. Like, how do you know where things are getting blocked up and it's yeah. all going pear shaped? You know. So. Yeah. And as a founder, I mean, as an owner of a business, those those bottlenecks, Peter, that are so critical. You you need to anticipate where they're coming and try and get ahead of it to either hire uh, or get some technology in place to to make sure that you don't get them. So, and it always changes. From for me, we get bottlenecks in the associate space. Then we're getting bottlenecks in the para planning space, and then and so you're just trying to constantly stay ahead of bottlenecks. Yeah, you're right. And you clear one and it moves to the next thing. But that's just the process. Yeah. That's just streamlining, you know, and, and invariably we turn out, out to be one of the bottlenecks, you know, invariably. <laughs> I'm, the I'm the worst enemy. Yeah, I'm yeah. always throwing spanners into I just try right? I try to get as least involved in there as possible. Yeah. Um but but what has what has happened is once we've gone through all that heavy lifting process, um, we've got these good systems in place, we've got the managed accounts running really efficiently, is once, once you've scaled that mountain, it's not like you're sort of skiing down the other side of it, but it gets a lot easier because every mm. time we do an investment committee and then a change, there's no ROAs. There's no ongoing advice production. So, whilst there's a lot of scaling the mountain, once you get to the peak and the summit, you can breathe and then you can just focus on, on different things, which for us is just constantly trying to improve the client experience and trying to improve sort of strategy and those types of things rather than constantly fighting that battle of ROAs, investment switches, all this stuff that um, we're just so glad we scaled that mountain now. And that's interesting, actually, they bring that up because, um, you know, you talked about shifting discretion and and the way that would change the dynamic. I'm assuming it then significantly changed the review experience or what was covered or, you know, that must have been quite different, you know, for you and and particularly you, I guess, but the other advisors is, well, suddenly the meeting's quite different, you know. Yeah. (laughs) Absolutely. I mean, we've always tried to focus on goals and strategy and where they're heading. Are they on track? When can they retire? All those sort of things. But what this has really done is because the comms piece as part of your, um, your managed account is so much, uh, it's so much more involved. So, um, right. whereas before they'd probably get communication uh, when we did our six monthly review. Now they get, they get comms every month. So investment yeah. committee meets, they get an inside view of what the committee's thinking about. Why would he, did we make any changes? Didn't make any changes? And quarterly, a comprehensive portfolio review of what funds have changed, what's going on in the markets, what's the macroeconomics, all of that. Um, so their comms, they're, they're getting a lot more communication through the period. So when we do our six monthly or quarterly or, or, or annual catch up, they're already across most of the investments. So we don't need to spend yeah. a huge amount of time bringing them up to speed because they're already sort of across it. So it does take that investment piece off the table and we can focus more on the important stuff. Now, there will be times when the markets are quite stressful um, and the investment piece will come back in and we'll obviously have more conversations around volatility and portfolio. But mostly, yes, what it does is it dilutes down the amount of time you need to spend on uh, discussing the portfolio and more times in terms of, okay, what's going on in your life? What can we do? What are you looking to buy? What you know, All, the, all those sort of strategic decisions. Now, I'm keen to dive into comms, but let's sort of take a little step back and talk documentation. So, you've made the decision, you're sort of looking at, you know, you've had this 80-month project and we're mapping it all out. What was the, was the first step like an internal document or like what was the first thing that made it, you know, words on a page? What was, what was, what did that form did that take? So the, uh, the investment committee has its own uh, compliance and regulations and corporate governance. So there's definitely a written investment philosophy that gets put in place. Um, the first uh, document that gets p- uh, put together is a, a product disclosure statement, which is built out. Um, and then our investment manager works with the trustee of the platform to sort of build that out. So that were the, probably okay. the first documents uh, that really 
these sort of sort of words on a bit of a page. Uh, and then from there, then it morphed into more advice type documents. So we would okay. catch up with a client. You're happy to give up your discretion. We think you're going to be better off because ultimately you follow our advice anyway. That's typically why you're, you're paying us. And so probably I'd say 95% um, of the clients said, yes, we're happy on giving up the discretion. You know, a couple of clients, uh, they just like to sort of think that stay in control. That's fine. There's yep. no judgment. There's no right and wrong, just different outcomes. It just means mm. that the executions are, um, from a timing point of view is a little bit slower. And then you have that conversation and then the paperwork really then becomes that statement of advice. And really, it's the statement of advice where you map through this is where you were, this is where you're going, this is what the cost to change is, if there is any cost. But ultimately, this is the differential. You're moving into a world where we're going to take discretion. We're going to make the investment choices for you moving forward. Um, but it's an in-specie thing. So, at any time, if you want to move out of that world, you can in-specie that without cost straight back into your own portfolio and take full charge of it and off you go. So, it's not okay. a forever thing. It's a timing differential. Now, having said that, we are lucky in that we're able to negotiate with certain fund managers to get a cheaper MER when you're running right. a managed account solution. So, if they did in decide to exit and in-specie back out of the managed account and that managed that cheaper MER fund is not available, then that would end up being cashed down and they'd have to buy the slightly more expensive one. But but for all intensive purposes, mostly, it's uh, you come in, if you're enjoying the experience, you stay. If you're not enjoying the experience and you want to take control back and make your own investment decisions, it in-species straight out nice and clean. Okay. And so, uh, you know, you you talked about a PDS, which we all know, you know, is is – required and incorporates mm. all sorts of things. It's generally not done as something that, you know, a potential client will go, ooh, let me sit and, and enjoy and read through this document. No, I'm curious. Yep. <laughs> right, exactly. Let me <laughs> knock myself on the head so I can go to sleep. Um, it, did you also produce anything like a brochure or a, like any any of those sort of more client-centric comms in terms of, you know, explaining, you know, the approach or why you were doing this, any of that sort of material? Did you produce anything on that front? Look, Pete, I think that would have been a great idea. I think truth be told is we didn't really do a lot of that. It was really one-on-one, -on -one, every meeting, okay. having a discussion. Uh, is this suitable for you? Do you really understand what the change is here? And are you comfortable to do it? Um, so, it was more of that kind of one-on-one. -on -one. And we just did it. We weren't looking to transition everyone straight in. It right. was uh, we launched the portfolio. We would do our review meetings. We'd have those conversations with clients. If you want to transition in, we would we would manage it um, as opposed to sort of a big comms that went out and said, look, here's a new world, bright and shiny <laughs> toy. Do you want it mm. or you don't want it? I just think because it was so such an important conversation, I didn't want mm. anything to be lost in translation uh, on a sort of a bit of paper. Yeah. Whereas when you're actually speaking to a client, you can pick up on their uh, on their – um, on their body language, do they really understand it? Do they feel comfortable with this? Because uh, it is a big change. And it is, it's an interesting thing. There's often a debate when you're talking to advisors about any change, right, to any process really. And, you know, consent was one, all these sort of things. There's always these two schools of thought. Some are like, no, I'm going to change it all at once. I just want to get it done and I'm going to do the change and others. And I'm with you. Look, if you've already got a structure in terms of schedule in place, like if there's something that's a cycle that people are already scheduled into timeframes through the year, then just make the change as that comes up. You know, and and then it's all part of that process, and it yeah. and it's not as quite as disruptive even to the client. So I'm with you there. Rolling it out that way just makes it manageable. And, and that made sense for us because remember our portfolios really had already been mostly constructed. What what wasn't different was they hadn't moved into the world where the the change could happen from a discretionary point of view. So. By the time we're having the conversation, most people's portfolios were looking fairly similar to the new world they were moving into. Yeah. Um, so, it's not like there was a rush to get them into one world to the next. It was yep. a slow transition. Um, if all my clients were in something totally different, were moving into a totally different world and I really felt hand on heart, they needed to move quickly, I think it absolutely would have been a different. It would have been a big comms out. We would have been straight on the phones. We'd have lots of conversations and we probably would have burnt through our power planners and our associates <laughs> and <laughs> talk yeah. about smoke coming out of the machine. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, in terms of managing the them, um, we were lucky. As I said, we, we structured it in a way that we could do this slowly and transition it. So, not too much stress on my team because really, you've got to balance. You really do need to balance your staff being happy and your clients being happy. There's no point that balance getting too out of whack. You know? So, all of, our all of our employees are so passionate about making sure our clients live a magnificent life. That, 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 that is fundamental to the core of them coming into the practice. Um, and we want to nurture that because then it reflects back on the clients because then the clients have a much better experience. So, getting that balance between what the team could do without burning them out and getting the clients into this new world, yeah, for us, it was probably a 12 to 18-month um, experience. 
And I guess, um, you know, a, a reflection of that is also the fact that clearly, uh, well, sorry, it's clear to me when I was looking at your website and as we've been talking that, you know, the investment piece or, or the philosophy is is an important part of what you guys do, but it's not the only part. It's maybe not even the most significant part. There's a whole lot of other stuff you do with these clients and for them that means this is just one of the tools. You yeah. know, this is just one of the things you bring to bear. And that to me was reflected in the fact that, you know, if you look at your website, it's not like you're leading with this. You know, it's not a whole page dedicated to, I'm curious, you know, is is that merely a reflection of that? Is it merely that that you don't place as, place in the investment philosophy as front and centre? You know, it's yeah, not that first thing? Look, the, the, the truth is that the heart and soul of long-term returns comes from your strategic asset allocation and, and matching a client with that and, and making sure that they hang on. Everything else we build around that is around the edges. And it's not that it's insignificant. It's really, really important. Um, but that then, I guess what I'm saying is that's really about understanding clients and their relationship with money and strategy that mm. goes around that. But don't let me dismiss the importance of portfolio management. So, we take it very, very seriously. We just don't lead with our chin for it. It's sort yeah. of, it's there. And we do have some high-end families that come through the door who are used to getting, you know, investment bank type solutions in terms of sophistication around portfolios. So, they're expecting, you know, a very professional solution and being able to leverage off Mercer, the largest asset consultant in the world, to be able to construct and build portfolios that can match the sort of solutions you've, you've been used to receiving. Um, so, they want to make sure that they're getting a very, very good solution on portfolio management. But once they understand that that is running, it doesn't become the central cornerstone of what we do for them. Now, some clients are a little bit more focused on the investment mandate, particularly in that kind of wholesale space. You know, they they like to have a little bit of the sizzle around the steak and Mm -hmm. and it gets a little exciting and all that sort of thing. But but ultimately, the core is making sure that that core portfolio runs, it's professionally run, um, and then we can sort of focus on those strategic things. Because if if you get the strategic wrong, you can have the best portfolio in the world. (laughs) If they sell at the bottom, irrelevant, totally irrelevant irrelevant. So, really, the strategic part is so critical. So, we tend to lead more on the strategic side of it um, and also intergenerational wealth. I mean, you've got if, if you're managing significant wealth and you don't educate the children and then they Oof. inherit all this wealth, talk about blowing up strategy. You're right. Um, Returns so, are immaterial at that uh, point, you know. <laughs> just, absolutely. You know. So, we try to bring the children up and through from an education point of view as early as possible. You know, and it's an interesting uh, thing to reflect on, you know, for the listener is understanding, you know, your offering and the value you give and where the investment philosophy sits as part of that probably will help them determine how, like you say, lead with your chin, like how extreme you go with those comms in terms of how, you know, is it the first thing they see? Is it on the landing page? You know, is the, or is it part of just the advice? So I think that's, that will help people make that decision is understanding where yeah. it sits in your offer. I mean, you, yeah. you mentioned early on a lot about, you know, the cash flow and the, and the working on that with them um, actually delivered more to then invest. Well, clearly that then is an important part of what you're doing, oh, you know, so it would make more sense that that would be part of what you'd be leading with, you know, because it, it's first. It, it really, really is the lifeline. Whether, it, whether you're a younger accumulator trying to get ahead, trying to get ahead of your debt, build wealth, there's a real psychology to being able to save a little bit and build on those savings. So, we've got a great story of a client that we've worked with that started on $500 a month savings, right? Struggled to do that and are now saving close to $25,000 a month, house fully paid off, could retire if they wanted to, sort of just hit the age of, you know, 50, financially free, but they'll never stop working because they're doing what they, they love and do. So, that's an example of controlling cash flow. Yeah. Um, now, but you also, you've got the high-end families where you've got, you know, multiple um, companies, trusts, unit trusts, self-managed super funds, cash is going everywhere. If you want to work closely with their accounts to control the cash, all they want to know is, where's my pot that I can spend and I want the rest of this money to work really efficiently for me and the kids and multiple generations. So, it's, it's still about controlling and managing that kind of cash flow and psychology around it. So, yes, we do tend to focus on there. We are we love strategy. Um, I love I, I love understanding what's going on in the investment world. It is part of it. Sort of, I'll go mm. for a walk every morning and I'll always be listening to kind of podcasts on economics, macroeconomics, investments because I just have a natural passion for it. But we're not, as I've sort of said at the start, we're not looking to be active traders because I don't think we're going to add value doing that. I'm not looking to buy and sell today or is today the top of the market? Should we go to cash? And Because ultimately, I don't think that that really works yeah. um, in terms yeah. of delivering returns for clients. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it is... 
you know, all of us as a well, more practice owners, I guess, than advisors in, that are employed, but certainly we all need to have a view on where our value sits. You know, where do we think our clients get the most out of us? You know, like what's where Absolutely. do we impact and then help that inform some of these decisions we yeah. make? You know about yeah. how we do things. So, for me, I guess it was a slightly easier decision because I love strategy. I love the strategy component. And this is that dishwasher analogy. I said I would try and get into the conversation. <laughs> so, so everyone, everyone can try and pack a dishwasher, all right? And when you open it the next day, it's going to be clean. But what I've learned, because I do, I do, I'm in charge of packing the dishwasher at home, is getting the amount of all the plates and bowls in there it's actually a little more challenging if you want to get it all in one go, right? Yeah. So, and what I learned was to get everything in, I actually had to go on YouTube to say, how do I stack this dishwasher so I can get everything in there efficiently? Because if you'd stack it all too close, then everything's dirty when you pull it out. Yeah. So, there's there's an art to stacking it. There's an art to getting the cycle on the dishwasher to, do I do the, the eco? Do I do the night? What I'm trying to say is when you construct portfolios, there's a real skill and an art to it and you've either got that skill or you don't have that skill. If you're yeah. an advisor with that skill and you feel that's your value proposition to your clients, awesome. absolutely fabulous. But, yeah. you know, when you're competing against the likes of someone with Mercer with 1,500 analysts and that's all they're doing on a daily basis it's and you're, you're one person in, a, in, a, in a, an advisory practice – you're up against it, I think, generally. Yeah. Now, that, I'm one person, right? That's my view. Um, so, for us, it was an easy decision to make. Let's go with a professional, have the professional run the portfolios. We're professional on the strategic side. Let's focus. Let's stay in our lane. And look, as somebody who is hopeless at stacking the dishwasher, I completely <laughs> agree with you. I'm just not interested. You know, things go in the box. That's really as far as I get. And then I get frustrated because they don't all go in the box. You well, know, my it. husband like, rolls his eyes. <laughs> and and he it. was a Tetris kid. I actually think there's an alignment with Tetris and packing the yeah, dishwasher. Uh, I think it's a similar uh, thing. <laughs> I get a bit OCD with it. I'm like, there's an, I get so much pride when that dishwasher is so beautifully packed. Um, <laughs> and then it's the cycle because we've got solar panels. Do I run it at night? Do I run it during the day, which is the cheapest? Day. Anyway, it's a pretty mm. loose analogy. But what I'm saying is there's lots of moving parts when it comes to portfolio construction. Either do it in-house, but just get it right or bring in a professional and get it right because those quarter of a percent return differentials or even just stripping out some of the volatility and getting similar returns take some stress out of your client's journey, which ultimately means that they're less likely to break strategy and they're going to have a better, um, a better experience through the journey. Absolutely. Absolutely. So then, you know, if you think back through then that implementation, and like you said, it's it's effectively over a good couple of years at that that sort of took you to go through that process. You know, were there any surprises out of that? You know, any things that were easier or harder or came out of it that you just didn't expect? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I don't know if there was too many surprises. It was um, th- – there weren't always easy conversations because clients – we're used to uh, a certain way of doing things right. for eight, nine years. And then all of a sudden- you trained them to, hadn't yeah, you? Yeah. <laughs> and they said, look, do what we tell you to do and, you're, and your portfolios are going to grow alongside you and you're going to have a lot of financial freedom and choice. And it was working. It was working really, really well. As I told yeah. you, the, the fund was just growing because everyone was um, being such great savers and building wealth. Mm. And so, the conversation was, uh, uh, which I think was surprising to me was, well, why would I change? Because this is working and it has worked. So, why- why do we need to do something different? And I guess the conversation then was, yes, it's worked. I'm not changing the methodology. I'm not changing the philosophy. I'm just changing the execution. Yeah. I want to be able to, now that we're running more money for you, to execute and deliver and just get those little quarter of percent differentials in terms of it. So, it's the same but different. So, that probably yeah. would have been the surprise that I hadn't really thought through where they thought, wow, this is great. This is working so well. Why change? Yeah. And it isn't it because, I mean, we use the expression change management when we talk about staff, but, you know, it's probably a valid thing for, for clients. What's the change management exercise? Because you have trained them well. Mm. You know, they all know how to turn up for the meeting and what you're going to cover and this is what I've got to sign. And, you know, yep. like, yep. like, and when anything's outside of that, it's like, wait, 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 what? You know, <laughs> why yep. is this different? You know, we're all human beings like that, aren't we? Yeah. Um, Our clients, uh, they love to hate us. They love to hate us because they know that we're in there going to soak up any excess cash. Um, yeah. And so, we like to metaphorically be sitting at the kitchen room table whenever they're sort of talking about money um, so that they can make sort of good decisions around sort of better, better. It's not that there's a good or a bad thing in terms of buying something, 
But if it's something that's not going to get them closer to something that's really meaningful to that family yeah. in terms of a lifetime goal, then we want to be metaphorically in that living room making sure they're making the right choice at that time. Yeah. It's the conscious thing. It's just doing yeah. it consciously, isn't it? I mean, who cares if they want to buy a giant giraffe statue that sits in the yard? That's not the <laughs> issue. It's that they love it, that there's a reason behind it, that there's yeah. something they're going to value every day and go out and go, this is fantastic. You know, So, it's, it's that conscious decision. I'm right there with you. I haven't seen that goal yet, but I look forward to seeing <laughs> that. You know it's going to happen now. We've put yeah. it out into the universe and one of your clients is going, hmm, that sounds like a great idea. And you'll think of me. I'll be going, why, why, why am I thinking of a why? giant giraffe statue? Yeah. It's something to do with investment philosophy. I just can't quite, you know. <laughs> and look, we've covered a lot of the challenges, like you say, and, and, you know, the clients having to make that change. Was there anything else that was particularly challenging out of the whole exercise? If you put it to your team, was there anything that was like, whoa, that was really hard? <laughs> Really, it was the workload. So, the workload okay. for me involved in terms of um, the time and energy spent in terms of nailing down the philosophy, getting the right team. That really, I, I had a lot of meetings. It really did burn up a lot of time, time that I could have been spending with clients. That was quite challenging. Yeah. Uh, but glad I did it because it's really sort of set us up. And then in terms of the, the staff really sort of fell in behind me, there's a lot of work in terms of this change. And, and right. so, um, I guess that was probably the most surprising thing. And that's the thing that really does need to be managed is you make a decision. Don't just make a decision and think it'll all just happen. Understand the implications of how it's going to impact your, your team. Do they have the capacity to do it? Do you need to resource them up? Do they need some extra technology to help them through? They're, they're probably the main things. But like looking back, lots of heavy lifting, mm. <laughs> lots of heavy lifting, um, but absolutely worth doing it. Um, but just be mindful of the impact it will have on on your team. And anything else, you know, if people are sort of thinking along these lines, then either that maybe you would do differently now reflecting back or just tips that you go, hey, if you're embarking on this journey, is there anything else that you'd suggest people sort of fold in or, or take into account when they're implementing their oh, investment just, philosophy? Just, just really hone in on that, on that investment philosophy. Um, what is it that, that you feel is your value proposition? What is it that you feel is your belief, core belief in terms of how you think the markets behave? Do yeah. you think they're efficient? Don't you think they're efficient? Do you think they tend to get a bit overvalued? Are you sort of an index driver or you're sort of an active manager? So, index has really become super popular. Um, mm. The challenge with index, and this is why I'm glad we've got the levers in there, is that it used to be 5% of the market and on some analysis now, we're getting closer to 50%. Yeah. And so, there's this kind of inflection point where all the money now is a momentum play. So, money goes into superannuation, goes straight into the market, goes straight into an asset allocation, straight into the, uh, you know, an index solution. Mm. So, while employment is strong, you've got this money washing in, driving the market forward. If unemployment goes, starts to go up, all of a sudden, the momentum comes. And so, the valuations t tend to shift a bit. So, you want to be able to pull these levers that's saying money going in, if the vowels are looking a bit stretched, geez, it'd be good to have a value manager in there, probably just sort of right. protecting yourself a little bit. Yeah. Um, and so, just to be able to sort of pull some of those levers, because I do get a little nervous when in, when sort of index is sort of rising at such a rapid rate. I think the volatility in the market, because you can imagine if people panic and they pull the money out, if they press sell on an index, it comes straight out of the market. If yeah. you press sell on an active manager and they're carrying 10 or 20% cash buffer and they think the markets are a bad time to sell, they can cash you out from the cash fund. Right. Same when money's coming in. If 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 you're if you've got a, an active manager in there and you've said right, I want to I want to go and buy, and the active manager saying, oh, it's looking a bit toppy. Why don't we just sort of sit on a bit of cash? The market comes back and then they pull your cash in. So there's a bit of a buffer yep. zone there. Yeah. There's no buffer on index. If yep. someone presses sell, the market's gonna it's gonna it's gonna swing. Um, so yes, for us, we just wanted to be able to have those. I'm not saying that the markets aren't efficient. I just think they're gonna the, the volatility is gonna increase as the as the index increases. Well, and look, the truth is <clears throat> there is a big difference between the theory of these things and the and, and the practicality of them. And mm. and an index is a good example because it's not like there's this one index that covers all markets or mm. even an individual index that covers all possible markets and therefore you can fully diversify and then you can like it's not that perfect right yep. so either way even if even if you went all in there's still an element to which you're going to have to fill um to make sure that you're getting like you say you know correlation and diversification all those things that are at the core of all of this yeah. Yeah. um we don't have all of the tools at our disposal required to even implement that perfect 
sort of approach, you know, yeah. as a philosophy. So, and, and it makes it challenging. I mean, this is probably uh, not so much an investment decision, but from a from a governance point of view, at the moment you've got index. Index drives money into bigger companies, so there's an incentive for companies to keep getting bigger and bigger and acquire smaller ones. They get more in the index, they get more money. The cost of capital goes down further, so they can acquire other smaller companies with higher cost of capital, and then you get these mammoth companies, and you've got less competition. So right. you know it, that'll sort of play itself through, but that'll be more of sort of political decisions, I think. Mm. Uh, but f- as an investment manager, uh, we want to make sure that we give our clients the best opportunity because what they do is they stress test it. So, we'll have a health check every year and says, well, if we have a in- high inflation environment, if we have stagflation, if we have a major recession, if we have all these scenarios, how is your portfolio? Is it strong enough to sustain itself through all these sort of market testing? Uh, and we have that sort of stress test and then they'll just fine tune the portfolio based on uh, being able to sort of have left and right tail events, but also where they they think the next sort of because we'll also have a bit of a DAA overlay on the um, strategic so that we can just because we're carrying a little bit of excess cash at the moment. Yeah. Um, you know, it's starting to look a little bit more attractive on duration with those sort of treasuries sort of ramping up to 4.7, 4.8, almost 5%. But it just gives, yeah, it just gives us that sort of little bit of extra flexibility in terms of portfolio management. Yeah, absolutely. And this stress testing is interesting, not just from a, um, hey, getting some comfort for, say, yourself, your team on the approach, but also that's a great thing to be able to share with clients is, mm. hey, they're just thinking about all of these possible scenarios and mm. the clients are like, wow, I couldn't get my head around all that. You know, I mean, it's that's yeah. got some rigor to it that would feel good from a client's yeah. perspective. And that's, that's so critical to have that correlation correct and attribution correct because, you know, <laughs> imagine if you had two friends and they're both happy at the same time or they're both sad at the same time. Yes. You're either going to be having a party or it's you're just commiseration, yeah. right? But yeah. if you had one friend who was happy sometimes and the other one could be sad but not at the same time, then you're going to have a slightly <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, it's managing that correlation on the portfolio management is kind of really important as well and just the variability. So, um, you know, uh, you, you can have recessions, you can have boom periods. Um, so, yes, have a sophistication that when you construct portfolios, you're mindful of where we are today, where are we heading. Don't try and second guess markets, but make sure you've, you've built a portfolio. Basically, have you built a ship that can sail through the storms yeah. um, at the pace that you want to go? So, if you're in a speedboat because you're high growth and, and there's storms, make sure your speedboat's going to make it through and you're up for that journey. Yeah. Or you get on the uh, QE2 through a storm. <laughs> it's going to be it's pretty calm. It's going to take a little bit longer, but yeah. if that's, if that's sort of the journey you're after. So be it. It's all good. Yeah, and you know what to expect. Yeah. You know, I think that's key with all of this. Look, Michael, thank you so much for being so open, you know, with the process you've gone through and really generous with your time. I know this will be incredibly helpful to the listeners and they've got a whole lot of value out of that. Um, and, you know, to see through your eyes over quite some time, you know, the way that's evolved and the way you implemented it has been fantastic. So thank you so much for coming on the series. No, thank you, Peter. I love listening to you on the uh, on the podcast. I can't wait for the uh, the next Advisor Tech one as well. Um, so, absolute pleasure to be here with you. 